Hello, and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in KSP 1.0.2. This time, the EDB intends to begin construction of its Kerbin Orbit Station, which will be the primary workplace for Kerbal astronauts and the destination of their GBN commutes. To do this, the EDB has begun development of the ETS, the Elegant Transportation System, starting with the EDB shuttle. On ascent, the EDB shuttle is configured to perform as closely as possible to the NASA shuttle. However, the EDB orbiter is designed for greater mission flexibility and aerodynamic capability. In other words, it can transfer itself out of low Kerbin orbit to the Moon or Minmus, for example, and it does not fly like a brick. It flies much like an airliner. Uh, this is the purpose of its noticeably heftier wing design, as well as the V-tail, which provides maximum stability at the cost of maneuverability. The shuttle's external tank has no engine, just like the NASA shuttle, and its boosters have the most powerful engines available. Though they are thrust limited depending on the load being carried in the shuttle itself, the shuttle has a maximum capacity of 25 tons, just like the NASA shuttle. As with the NASA shuttle, the EDB shuttle's boosters are meant to complete their work a quarter of the way to orbit. The shuttle's main engines are three skippers for flexibility and also to give it the ability to take off from a runway under its own power. The shuttle also has four rapier engines. When carrying a heavy load, as it will be here, the shuttle lights its top two rapiers on liftoff in addition to the main engines. So you'll see that in a moment. And with that, we're ready to go. Valentina Kerman is the commander of ETS-1, the mission to put the EDB station core into orbit. T-8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, main engines lit, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the EDB shuttle on ETS-1 to low Kerbin orbit. You can see that the shuttle is uh, balancing itself here carefully. Uh, first try on this, so uh, we expect there will be refinements to the shuttle's balance in future missions. But it, look, it looks good here, and soon it'll begin its roll program to its launch azimuth. It has to roll 9 degrees. And there you see also that uh, the top skipper engine is tilted a little bit differently than the other two. And of course, the shuttle's main engines are not meant to be used in orbit. Only the rapiers will be used in orbit after it drops the external tank. You'll notice that there is mod propellant as well as liquid fuel and oxidizer. Uh, the shuttle actually has Werner engines as well as RCS ports and so it has dual redundancy on those two systems. Both systems can be used independently to maneuver the shuttle in orbit and also to maintain attitude on the way down. It's a good thing that Valentina is the commander of this mission because it looks like the other Kerbals are a bit out of sorts, though the flight is going nominally so far. And just a reminder, the NASA Space Shuttle, its boosters, its solid rocket boosters, lasts for about 2 minutes and 3 seconds before being decoupled and that is 2 minutes and 3 seconds into an 8 minute flight and so what you'll see here is that more quickly than you would normally expect this shuttle will be dumping its boosters and that will be roughly a quarter of the way into its flight to orbit and so we'll see it soon here it's very important that the shuttle maintain attitude and you can see RCS is on and it will refrain from any sort of maneuvering while those boosters are decoupled. There you see, it's, it's extremely important of course because of the huge wings of this shuttle and the likelihood that the decoupling could strike them, but separation is clean and the shuttle continues. You can see the superb balance involved here. Indeed, while the wing configuration of this shuttle is not quite as elegant as that of the NASA shuttle, uh, actually not even close, uh, it's important to note that it is ideally suited to the atmosphere of Kerbin. And so that is the trade-off that we have here. You can see Werner engines on the external tank as well firing, making sure to maintain attitude and help the shuttle out. However, there there isn't an abundance of reaction wheels involved. There is uh, one 2.5 meter reaction wheel at the top of the external tank and another one at the bottom, as well as the the 
torque available in the cockpit, the Mark III cockpit of the shuttle. But that is the limit of the torque available to the shuttle. We do not have, we are not attempting to spam uh, reaction wheels here. And this is with a load in the bay. The shuttle has been tested with an empty load, and in that case, it does not require the rapiers. And in fact, the rapiers have turned off temporarily as the shuttle begins to pitch down. There is also a matter of unlocking the top tank. For balance sake, the top tank in the external tank is kept locked on ascent, and that is to maintain the center of mass. And now you can see the fuel being pumped up from the bomb tank to the middle tank. And again, that is to raise the center mass as the fuel de depletes in the external tank. These are the key secrets into how to make a space shuttle work. Uh, now you see the rapier is lit again as it has uh, pitched down to its desired attitude for the rest of the way to orbit. When not carrying a heavy load, of course, the, the skippers are not necessary to maintain attitude. It is only because the shuttle side is heavier in this case that when the rapiers are off, it will tend to uh, pitch down like that. You can see that the skippers are overheating. That is perfectly nominal. They will not reach the maximum overheat before orbit, uh, regardless of the load involved. The feel of this shuttle overall is meant to mimic the CSS shuttle as modified for Realism Overhaul. Uh, Realism Overhaul being the set of mods that include uh, turn Kerbin into the real Earth, include all sorts of realism mods and all that sort of thing. And the CSS shuttle feels a lot like this shuttle. And the overall launch profile is very, actually very similar. And that is sort of the purpose to the way that this is tuned. And so you'll see a relatively long flight at this point as the shuttle makes its way to orbit. And that's very similar to the way the real space shuttle works. It does spend uh, six minutes on its own engines with the external tank, which is obviously why the external tank of the space shuttle is so big. It should be noted that this shuttle does have internal stores of liquid fuel and oxidizer for its extended missions. As noted, it has greater mission flexibility, but those tanks are currently locked and are not used with the main engines. And so right now, the main engines and rapiers are drawing exclusively from the external tank and they do not draw from the inter internal tanks of the shuttle. The rapiers eventually will use the shuttle's own internal fuel stores when in orbit. I noted that the boosters had to be thrust limited depending on the mass of the payload in the shuttle, but it might not be the way that you think. They are thrust limited down as the shuttle payload increases, so the more load that the shuttle is carrying, the less thrust we need on the booster side. And that is for balance reasons and maintaining the angle of the, shell, uh, the center of thrust through the center of mass. Uh, but that ends up creating the shuttle's payload limit. The reason it has a payload limit of 25 tons is that that's the point where the boosters have to be thrust limited so low that the shuttle barely makes it off the ground. Uh, they, the thrust weight ratio of the stack is not not enough to lift anything more than that. Otherwise, we will need to add more thrust to the shuttle side. Here we see that the shuttle has reached its intended apoapsis, and now we are waiting for uh, external tank separation here. And that's the ignition of the additional two rapiers and the shutdown of the space shuttle's main engines, which are glowing red hot there, white hot even. And so you can see the overheating present but mild, and the external tank is separated. Right now, the locked fuel tanks on the shuttle will be unlocked. There is a fuel tank on the payload. It will remain locked, obviously. But uh, here, the shuttle is uh, rolling over. That's just for vis visibility's sake, so that we get a good look at it. So now you'll see where the fuel is located here. We can see 8 tons over the wings in those nacelles there. And so those are unlocked. And then also in the tail, we have tanks that are not fully filled because this is for low carbon orbit service and those we fully filled if we wanted to transfer to the moon or Minmus for instance. 
and so that is the situation there right now they are just uh, but they do have to be uh, drained to this point basically in order to re-enter the shuttle's center balance would not be correct if they had more fuel in them than they do now right now it is able to re-enter uh, this is a proper fuel load this or less would be a proper fuel load for re-entry and here at Apoapsis, we will have OMS burn for orbit. This is only a single OMS burn. We didn't need one on the external tank separation because Apoapsis was already where it was intended to be. And the shuttle will attempt to reach a nominal orbit for payload separation. Actually, it uh, seems to be a little bit lopsided and so a minor correction will be done with the OMS engine so we will have a second OMS burn after all and here the correction is made and with that the shuttle is ready to separate its payload for now the cargo bay doors are not action grouped and that's because six action groups are already used for the shuttle and uh, but we'll probably add an action group for the cargo bay doors as well but uh, here you can see that the shuttle bay is completely packed with its payload. The very forward portion is its own docking port, which it will retain. But uh, the rest of what you see there is after the separator is the actual payload. And we are waiting separation here. All checks done. It's a very, very tightly packed payload. And uh, there it is off. Now, it doesn't have any way to charge up its electric charge. Uh, solar arrays have not been deployed yet, obviously. And so we will have to have solar trusses uh, sent up at a later date. Not entirely sure whether those will fit into the shuttle or whether they will need a special launcher of their own. But right now, that is, that is the payload for you. And uh, we will probably uh, lock up the batteries to make sure it doesn't completely deplete of electric charge. It does have its own controller. Uh, no crew on board right now because there is no way to replenish electric charge. And yes, mainly a docking facility for further modules is what you see. And so that's the core of it. But also there is room for Kerbals to visit and of course a cupola module for them to enjoy the view. The station will be named Hoffman Station, and this is after Jeffrey Hoffman, who was a five-time shuttle astronaut, and also the professor for the MIT lecture on the space shuttle, which told me basically everything I know about the space shuttle, except for what I've learned in, in bits and pieces from elsewhere. So uh, there is a freely available online MIT lecture series on the space shuttle with Professor Jeffrey Hoffman and I highly recommend that if you want to learn more about how the space shuttle actually works. He has a lot of guests in and those guests were all involved in the development of the space shuttle itself so the actual designers are guest lecturers in that lecture series. And with that done it is time for the space shuttle to make its re-entry and I'm sure you are all wondering whether it could successfully re-enter or not and to what degree. Um, we don't have a good number on where it should re-enter, re where its periapsis should be, and so we're just going with the typical 30 kilometers, uh, though that's with every expectation that that will overshoot the mark. And we will try to manage that with a combination of air brakes and pitch, but uh, it's going to be a complicated affair. Now, the trouble with this space shuttle, uh, it, it's good on ascent as far as matching the real space shuttle, but it's not good on descent because of its huge wing. And in particular, uh, the size of its wing in relation to its control surfaces means that it has difficulty maintaining a pitch up angle. It will tend to push itself down more towards prograde, so it can't do the 40 degree up pitch angle that the space shuttle does. Uh, it tends to want to do about 20 uh, rather than 40. Uh, it can be sort of uh, nudged up to 30, but it, it really doesn't do 40 very well, which means it doesn't produce as much drag as the space shuttle does on re-entry. Uh, it tends to produce more lift. It's also worth pointing out that the space shuttle does not have solar panels to recharge itself. It does use fuel cells, and as a matter of course, uh, 
the fuel cells are always activated on the scent and so you see here uh, the activation of the fuel cells uh, a little bit hard to get to them at this point but there we go so fuel cell activated and that's to make sure that electric charge keeps running for the sake of uh, torque or the reaction wheel in the cockpit all right and so systems are go and you'll see Valentina pitching up the shuttle but as it turns out uh, the, the shuttle is going to be overshooting and so you see also deployment of air brakes but those are really not enough um, air brakes are not quite as effective as they once were and with the current orbit of the shuttle more will have to be done to bring it down Valentina is valiantly attempting to get to a 40 degree pitch there using the RCS system to provide the additional control. That, that's not unlike the Space Shuttle. Space Shuttle does run RCS on the way down. Actually, uh, Valentina doesn't do a bad job at all of maintaining attitude here as the shuttle crosses the ocean towards the home continent, uh, but the trajectory is so far off that this is just creating too much lift for the shuttle. And you can see that there. Really at this point the shuttle, the end of the orbit should be touching the KSC uh, if it wants to actually make a smooth landing at the KSC. This is way overshooting uh, for uh, given the aerodynamics of this shuttle in particular. And so you see as the shuttle enters into the airspace above the home continent that Valentina basically has it flat. And while for the real space shuttle that would not be good for its re-entry because of re-entry heating, uh, there doesn't seem to be any particular re-entry heating problems for this shuttle uh, through this part of the atmosphere. And uh, it is uh, losing speed reasonably quickly despite this orientation. Obviously if it was pitched up more, uh, it would lose speed uh, much more efficiently, but right now it's uh, doing quite fine. Air brakes lowered to avoid them overheating. They do, they do tend to have overheating problems below 30 kilometers and will of course explode if they, if they end up having that issue. But right now the shuttle, whatever Valentina might try and do, will be overshooting and so she will need to turn it around. MIRS turns are not effective here. Uh, Valentina is banking right in order to uh, make it easier to do the U-turn that will be necessary to hit the KSC. And of course this is where this particular shuttle's aerodynamics is very helpful and the fact that it has the four rapier engines and the uh, ability to breathe in air and go into jet mode because uh, the shuttle is going to, on this initial test, uh, well test slash mission uh, overshoot as we still try and get the proper trajectory for re-entry for this system. Okay and here as we approach 20 kilometers uh, Valentina attempts to begin the U-turn. It's a little bit high and still a little bit fast to be doing this. It's probably advisable to wait until the shuttle is below Mach 2 but here she's attempting to use rapiers in jet mode in order to help out the turn. Really at this point it's like an ox as you would expect as we said it performs like an airliner and airliners don't particularly perform very well at 60,000 feet which is where where the shuttle is at right now at 20 kilometers in altitude. And of course airliners would probably break up at these speeds but that's beside the point. As the shuttle gets more of a grip in the atmosphere, has more air going over its wings, uh, it does perform a little bit better and you can see here it keep keeping a stable bank angle and turning successfully uh, without any instability. And as it goes lower it will perform like this even better and it does well just below Mach 1 and uh, below uh, 40,000 feet. So basically the flight regime for an airliner is the ideal flight regime for this shuttle. Having turned around here, Valentina finds out that she's quite a long ways away from the KSC, but no matter, 
the fuel is okay this is within acceptable limits though in the future we will have to bring it in quite a lot closer because this is pushing the limit of how much reserve fuel Valentina has at her disposal. You can see here uh, relatively level flight uh, no fuss cruising along it really won't be able to break Mach 1 here but it can uh, maintain reasonably level flight even without any sort of uh, pitch trim and here with the runway inside Valentina lines up with it and still going fast but that's because the, the crew simply didn't want to delay getting back home obviously this would be faster than an airliner would be on approach but this is still sort of a shuttle it's a space plane right and here the shell is on its glide slope and the engines are off. On future approaches, once we get the numbers down, it will be possible to have the shuttle come in without any use of the rapiers, at least that's the intention. And again, with its uh, superior aerodynamics, it should be able to land without any fuss. You can see the, the stability of the shuttle at this point. And here we are on uh, final approach. Under 1,500 meters. Runway altitude uh, 70 meters. Velocity as you can see quite tame and going down as the shuttle glides. one thousand meters we expect the gear to come down soon the gear is kept up to reduce drag for most of the descent but uh, now we are approaching touchdown speeds the gear is confirmed down and locked six hundred meters Five hundred meters, feet dry. Brakes will deploy to ensure a safe touchdown. There are no drag parachutes on the shuttle. Two hundred meters, a little bit to the left, uh, quite a bit to the left. Thirty, twenty, ten. Touchdown. Touchdown of the shuttle at the KSC runway. Valentina has brought it down successfully, uh, breaks her out. You can see that the shuttle does require uh, quite a bit of the runway length in order to slow down and stop. And uh, there is no intention to ever bring this down to the island runway if you were thinking that that was a possibility uh, as it overshot this uh, facility in the first place. But no, it does have to come around and land at the KSC otherwise it won't be able to find a runway suitable considering its well its girth anyway uh, there you have it the EDB shuttle in service successful deployment of the station core for Hoffman station and with that uh, we'll leave you with this image of the shuttle and say thank you for watching if you enjoyed this video Please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.